So hey guys, we're back again with Benjamin, um, who is known as Benjamin G W, I think, on Twitter. G J W. G J W on Twitter, and um, th this podcast is going to be slightly different in the sense that it's going to be more of an introductory kind of podcast, and you know Ben is going to have the opportunity to you know ask us a lot of questions, and we're going to ask him kind of like questions as well and you know it's almost a alpha test of the entire concept as a whole and yeah um over to you benjamin if you can just you know describe your background sure. and you know why you wanted to come on this podcast and then you know we can talk about nfts sure well uh thanks for having me guys yeah so basically um okay so my profile i'm not actually in the nft world as a as a technical I don't have the technical profile. I'm more of an observer. And um, I mean, I do invest in some, but maybe not in the speculative way or in the like in the most popular way at the moment where you just buy to sell, you know, buy low and sell high. And um, I find myself lately just really trying to explain NFTs to, or the concept of NFTs and tech behind it to people who aren't familiar with it and who only see at the moment, uh, you know, just expensive Twitter profiles, uh, profile pictures. So yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the podcast. Uh, I think it can be interesting to just, you know, talk about the different, really, um, I don't know, different use cases that NFTs have at the moment that individual creators are using. And uh, that's what I'm really bullish on. And I find myself arguing on Twitter a bit too much about me speaking of this and others understanding just expensive Twitter profile pictures. So, so yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm not going to miss the chance of uh, being a podcast with Grit Cult after three years of uh, foreplay. So, uh, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Pat, do you want to kick off with any questions? Um, yeah, just sort of um, getting into you're saying all talking about all the different sort of um, use cases that you see. Uh, for creators, is is there any that you, that stick out that you're seeing that are sort of uh, just on the horizon or that you're seeing in, initially uh, being being put into action? Yeah. So okay. So at the moment, uh, I think we all got, or most most of us people who maybe weren't too involved in the crypto world, I don't know, um, not too long ago actually. I think most of us first time we heard of NFTs was either Crypto Kitties back in two, 2017 or more or less around this bull run with crypto uh, crypto punks going for a million dollars, millions of dollars. So really like that's more or less the, the exposure that everyone has, or it's been the really the really kind of a, the awareness stage for most people. And at the moment, I don't know, crypto punks, uh, board, uh, board Ape Yacht Club, all, all of these kinds of NFTs, they're really very expensive. Um, it's kind of like a club memberships really. And, at the moment, their use is speculative or mostly speculative and as expensive Twitter profile pics. So most people, I think, or most people outside of the crypto world, this is more or less the exposure they have to NFTs. And I think it's a bit unfair because obviously if you just see that, you know, uh, I don't know, pixelated image goes for millions of dollars. And this is the first time you're reading anything about it. It's like the first thing that comes to mind is one, it's a scam. Two, it's money laundering and just a load load a really long list against it which really feels like uh talking points that crypto had a few years ago actually so uh as probably the listeners know like uh, i assume obviously that listeners are crypto fans like crypto has for a very long time had to fight against uh, you know the idea that was used for money laundering that was used for illegal activities that was used as a, that was mostly a scam that was a ponzi scheme and I think slowly people are starting to understand that there's um, many more use cases. So in the beginning, the, there was one use case, which was currency. Bitcoin came out. Every crypto wanted to be a currency. But then, I don't know, Ethereum and other smart contracts um, platforms came out. And people for many years start to see a different use to it. You know, like uh, smart contract platforms. You can really put everything permissionless and everything. And But for many years, you lag and you have to fight against these assumptions. And slowly people now understand crypto is more than just currencies. I think NFTs are in the same spot at the moment as crypto was maybe a few years ago, in that everyone sees NFTs as expensive profile picks for money laundering and speculation. And I think they're kind of blind to many other uh, different applications that NFTs have. And part of the value proposition of NFTs, I think, which 
I think is sad. So hopefully I think I'll be right in a few years. I think smart people are, are already leading the way. I'm just observing in this case. And uh, yeah, I like to write about them because I think um, it, it's doing a fair justice to them. So let, let's, I suppose, dive into the, some of the main kind of complaints against uh, NFTs. Like, wh what do you think people are saying about NFTs? Oh, definitely. Like, the first thing is, oh, I can right click, copy your image. Why the fuck would I pay millions of dollars for this? That's the, that's the main, like, first talking point everyone comes up with. But, um, so yeah, let, let's just, um, like, rebut them. I think one yeah. at a time. I think that might be pretty interesting. Um, so yes, yeah, so, yeah. So with the right click stuff, it's like people will pay to be um, verified on Twitter. I think I think that's probably one of mm. the most um, kind of interesting cases. The other the other like rebuttal I kind of seen is that okay, you can basically copy and paste the picture picture of Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. but only one person can really own it. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely the most perfect example because the thing is. And I'm continuing to use, because NFTs are art, whether we like it or not. And uh, NFTs are valuable. I mean, the thing is, okay, value or the way we humans perceive value is, is really, it's actually when I learned what value, what, how we truly define value is when I became a fan of NFTs or when I started, you know, went from not really hater, because I was never a hater, but finally understanding what was going on. Like really, the way... I think we understand value and I think you can guys can, can add some some knowledge here too because like uh, this is very like secondhand knowledge of mine it's very uh, difficult for me to explain in my own words but the way we understand value really a lot of it is mimetic a lot of it is we think something is valuable because we're kind of told it's valuable or because others think it's valuable so really it's really like that's how you know desire is really mimetic and value desired objects become valuable in a sense so really so I, I, I wrote this thread the other day, for example, using the example of, Pica uh, of a Picasso painting. Like, if, you, if you're born, you know, and you have zero, contact, uh, zero context or zero contact with kind of like a Western world or, you know, or just the world of art, and you see a Picasso with no previous knowledge, you would not think of it as valuable as someone who knows it's a Picasso would. And, you know, both are seeing the same picture or the same painting both can appreciate maybe they both have the same understanding of technical knowledge behind it all and um you know they see exactly the same thing but for one person who has no idea how valuable it is and you know nobody's told him or her how valuable it is nobody has um, given these ideas or these presumptions or these this added context to it they might not think anything of it whereas someone who you know knows it's a picasso does what's the real difference between the two i mean both see the same painting both have the same technical knowledge. One just knows it's valuable because in a sense, we've kind of like, it's not 100% this, but in a sense, we've, we've kind of been forced or told to think of it as valuable. And the thing is, we don't like to have these irrational thoughts of ourselves. So we don't like to think, no, I want this car because I don't know, I really like the engineering or I want this painting because I really like the painting. A very large aspect of it, I would say even most of it is really, there's, I don't really understand why I find this valuable. I just want it, and a lot of it's mimetic. And once I've achieved it or got it or, or purchased it or whatever, then afterwards I post-rationalize my decision for wanting it. So going back to NFTs, I think a, a large problem with, uh, with NFTs is that we all think we understand how we evaluate things, we value things, and we always want to add these rational aspects to our decisions and our way of valuing things. But... In reality, value is very irrational. It's very mimetic. And we just don't like to think of ourselves as, I don't know, primitive apes or, you know, following the theme. We don't like to think of ourselves as primitive animals who, you know, would just like something as others want it. And I think it's something that NFTs kind of, it's a difficult concept to wrap your head around it uh, in one moment, but it's valuable and it's art. And they've reached that point where like at least some of the projects at least not all but you know they are art because it's culture you know and they're valuable and others want it and there will never be less people who want it there will always be more sort of to uh extend on the uh, the car analogy you mentioned there it's like having a kit car versus the real thing you the 
the kit car may go faster and look just the same and it costs you less, but you'll, you'll never get, um, the same sort of, uh, clout or credit that you will by actually buying the original. And like, I, I find that's, that's another kind of easy way to kind of frame that is, um, like Grit said, the like verification badge on Twitter, it looks the same, but just having that, that official document is, is the difference a lot of the time. Um, jumping into sort of some other um, of the of the more mainstream opposition that you're seeing, one that gets repeated a lot that I see is the uh, the massive amount of electricity that's used by crypto. Um, is there any sort of what would you say about that? Like in terms of what's what's the common theme that you're seeing? Well, okay, so. I haven't seen any messages against NFTs regarding electricity uh, or energy consumption. I have seen them, of course, uh, you know, against uh, proof of work uh, blockchains like, I don't know, Ethereum or, or uh, Bitcoin, Spe especially against Bitcoin, of course, because, you know, like, uh, I don't know, was it February or something like that or March that these kind of this kind of narrative really got really heated and got really big. And, you know, uh, because I think that was we were still like uh, prices were going up every day, I don't know, 10 percent or 5 percent. That's when they started coming up, like, you know, visual graphics of like Bitcoin now, you know, the Bitcoin network um, consumes more energy than the country of Argentina or the country of Belgium. It was the next day, you know, so I haven't seen um, I haven't seen this, these arguments against NFTs. I have against crypto. And um, if you'd like my opinion on that, I don't really have an opinion because I lack the, the, the technical knowledge in that aspect. So, uh, I think. I don't know. Like the thing is, I see it from a narrative standpoint, and from a narrative standpoint, um, even if from a narrative standpoint, Bitcoin specifically and proof of work blockchains lose, even if it's true. I don't know if it's true or not that they, you know, that they consume yeah. from green energy um, or not. But from a narrative standpoint, they're 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 losing. In my yeah, just to interject here. So um, the common arguments regarding those. So, I mean, even Satoshi mentioned, um, and he gave the argument back on the Bitcoin talk forum or whatever, that um, the energy costs that increase due to crypto mm -hmm. are essentially ways of increasing the security of the, the, uh, the network. So what that basically means is that um, the more money you spend on maintaining the network, the more it's going to cost for people to like, you know, 51% attack it, which is basically, um, you know, using hashing power to, you know, rewrite the blocks and, you know, where it goes and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other argument that um, the Ethereum people, you know, are trying to take into account is it is costly. And what we want to do is essentially reduce it. And, you know, they plan to go on to proof of stake where it's, um, they say it's a lot more um, economically viable and it's a lot more like easier to access. So like you just need to buy, um, you know, Ethereum essentially to stake it. So, but going back to um, proof of work blockchains, the other thing is it's um, if, if you look at economics is there's a certain theory, I can't remember its name off my head, but it's um, as you increase the demand of something, you also in, you have a time lag, but you also increase the, um, to supply of something so um, what we're also seeing is that mo in most of america most the energy sources that are going into crypto are from green energy sources um don't quote me on that um I, i'm uh, something i just read on twitter so you know it could be fake as anything so there is significant evidence though that um like new new crypto um, infrastructure is using a disproportionately large amount of green energy, so to speak, um, for a number of reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's plenty of ways that they can use sort of excess energy in a way that isn't uh, isn't easy for um, things like providing air conditioning or electricity to homes where it's needed in various parts of the day specifically. Um, you can sort of take advantage of excess energy with crypto in a way that's harder to do with conventional systems. So the, the way I like to look at it is sort of, uh, you know, this is a price we kind of have to pay to go through to a new technology. And, you know, um, 
I, I, I don't if, think this would... if there's some sort of like uh you know volatility there in the meantime it's 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 a small price to pay to maybe force a lot more money into uh renewable energy and specifically like nuclear and so on yeah so i i don't think it's a quote unquote um, price to pay i think in the long run um through like economic allocation what it's going to do it's going to build more effective ways of using that resource um so like yeah. over time as like as the price of something dwindles so like um, the price of oil has gone up but what we also kind of see is that the effectiveness of basically you know getting oil out has also inc- like you know um improved and then also the you know the utilization of that oil that we used to get for that was quite cheap but now it's a bit more expensive has also increased so like you have this like knock on effect where mm. you constantly want to you know effectively you know beat the market and you know doing that um, and i think what um what crypto is allowing us to do as well is also like allows allowing us on mass to basically you know create a new infrastructure grid yeah but i think like here's i'd like, I'd like to interject because these same arguments i think is what um kind of prove my point where i mentioned before that in the narrative battle mm. i think crypto is losing with the energy debate because i think us three are kind of on a similar page where we we see the the studies we see the facts we see that you know it makes economic um uh, there's economic incentives to go green uh you know to put your your bitcoin farm uh you know and next to renewable energy yeah. and everything because it's the cheapest yeah. and we understand this and this makes economic sense and these are the facts but this is like to quote Ben Shapiro I never thought I'd quote him facts <laughs> don't care about your feelings it's the opposite actually feelings don't care about your facts and the thing is here from the narrative standpoint is one person who is i don't know believes the narrative or pushes the narrative that bitcoin is bad for the environment just has to go very emotional about it and just say bitcoin is bad for the environment and that's it whereas on the other hand the kind of like defense or kind of counter narratives i don't think there's a strong counter narrative yet so like you see the michael sailors um and, the, and elon musk for example when this narrative was at its height they kind of made this bitcoin council I, I, don't quote me on the name but some kind of bitcoin mining organization where they were trying to go more green and everything and just like kind of like submitting to the narrative on one hand or when they were kind kind well they were trying to counter narrative is is like you're convincing the people who are pro bitcoin but you're not convincing absolutely anybody who's against it with the arguments because they're too long it's too technical to you know what i mean i i, I don't know if i'm yeah I, I i i i get your point but i think regarding um narratives it's like there's like not everyone has the same exposure to narratives so like mm-hmm. there's a the whole element of echo chambers the people that are inclined to the arguments they, they're gonna be like just you know end up in tunnels essentially so if you're open to crypto you're gonna understand more and then it's gonna make sense oh, and definitely. also the other thing is it's like economic incentive it's like over the long period of time it's just gonna be more and more economically viable to just invest in bitcoin so like yeah. even people like they were skeptical in 2013 you know they won't really be as skeptical in 2023 mainly because the US dollar inflation all these other variables are um you know not as solid as crypto so i i honestly like i i don't really think i mean my general kind of posture towards environmentalism is that it's it's a self it's a self solving complex problem that you know a lot of people are working on um and we had an interview with one of our guests and you know he he was very adamant that the whole um environmental issue should be like you know the primary reason anyone wakes mm-hmm. up so i i don't really agree with that and i don't i don't really want to get into that into the weeds too much with that but yeah uh, you know it's 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 a soft solving solving problem you know where that leads us I, i'm not sure but it's um it, it's going to get solved and also a lot of people are like they'll mint an nft and um the amount of like gas it costs on in a certain aspect is like the same as sending a tweet so i mean it, it really varies how you, how you kind of do things and um, again it, it goes back to like people will eventually like you know due to entropy will settle to the most effective way mm-hmm. oh definitely yeah mm-hmm. just um getting back to the sort of narrative part you're speaking about there do you see any hints of a sort of positive narrative that can be that can be written about to reach a, like a larger audience? 
um, you'd have to be more specific because like with Bitcoin, if we go to Bitcoin, like, um, like, okay, I'm a big, just as a, as a disclaimer, I'm a big fan of Ethereum, you know, I yeah. don't consider myself a maxi or anything, but I'm just a bit, um, I'm a bigger fan of Ethereum than Bitcoin. Okay. And for example, the narrative for Bitcoin is just very, um, I think well, at least the narrative for this bull cycle, because actually every kind of cycle has a different narrative for each crypto. Like first, you know, Bitcoin started as, you know, P2P cash, then it started as, um, well, continued as currency. And now it's more like the digital gold and it's kind of found some success in the digital gold. I think it's kind of reached its limit because people are not as interested in gold. Ethereum, I think it's still a bit more complicated to understand for the average person, I think. Like everyone's, I don't know, yeah. just internet computer. But when it comes to NFTs, I think NFTs are like, there's a lot of people like smarter people than myself and just people more involved in the crypto space. They all have the same feeling with NFTs that they onboard more um, people who are outside of crypto to crypto. So you know how like, like Dogecoin, for example, any every, anyone yeah. inside of crypto who takes it seriously kind of dislikes Dogecoin because like kind of thinks of it as a joke. But Dogecoin is, is probably is probably the coin or maybe the second coin after Bitcoin that's onboarded most people to crypto. Mm -hmm. NFTs have that kind of narrative in it, in that if you have to explain to someone like explaining uh, the, I don't know, the utility of digital gold and Bitcoin or explaining the utility in uh, the culture, uh, money culture and the internet computer, which is Ethereum, is way harder than explain, hey, have you seen this picture that's selling for millions of dollars? Yeah. Have you seen this fun picture that you can kind of trade almost as a currency even in, in, in some regard, you know, because it has economic value. So I don't know. I think I'm trying to figure out NFTs. I honestly have no clue about them. I'm trying to figure them out because there's something that I think we're all missing on, or at least, you know, the smarter people are already catching on that people outside of crypto are really attracted to and it's really onboarding a lot of people so i really see a narrative like even though right now people within the community or kind of people you know liminal to the to to the community you know kind of um think of it as a bubble and a speculative bubble it's onboarded loads of people yeah and one of the things i think is really interesting to that point is um the uis and user experiences so on that people have to go through to buy an nft right now are still like enormously complicated if you if you don't want to overpay and okay. so i i'm we're all sort of saying it's a bubble but everyone's also sort of waiting for this moment when somebody releases like a ridiculously easy way to buy nfts where people are able to just pay through their twitter account or their facebook account so it's sort of it's almost like this game of chicken that everyone's playing yeah well it's like to use the analogy of the trading world it's like robin hood versus traditional uh exchanges like any kind of you know quote quote serious trader wouldn't use robin hood like would use a more you know maybe a trade an exchange where you can do some technical analysis with more indicators and everything but the one trading exchange i, I read it on a tweet so it might not be true that has onboarded the most people to the trading world is robin hood because of the user interface and I think, honestly, I would 100% agree with you with the, with the user experience and everything involved buying an, uh, an NFT, not even involving gas prices. I'm not even going to go that road, <laughs> but just the whole idea of having to click like f three or four transactions, approve on your MetaMask, yeah. do this, do that. It's absolutely atrocious, like, honestly. I tried, yeah. to, um, I tried to cheap out on gas buying an NFT today, and I ended up wasting $120. And that's not the first time I've done that. So, like... You know, yeah. I, I can't imagine how many people go to buy their first NFT, screw up the like gas costs, lose hundreds of dollars and just be like, what? Right. Like that yeah. it's got to happen to people out there. And how do those people then go and become a, uh, you know, um, a, a missionary for them? Right. They're just going to be pretty shut down. One hundred percent. Yeah. Like uh, at the end of the day, it's like got to think of uh, kind of like how Amazon really focuses on you know the customer experience the user experience and they try to just take away all form of distractions and decisions and just really like hey if you want to buy just literally press the button and you've bought it i think something like that needs to happen in crypto i think it's kind of like what everyone agrees that maybe will be finally finally the kind of like mainstream adoption i think we're already quite mainstream to be honest but like true true mainstream and massive adoption 
but I think then maybe the next innovation is, I don't know, a layer on top of it, which is just the user experience. I'm not, I'm not sure. It's, it escapes a bit of my knowledge and my, I'm out of my depth there. Brett, do you know of anything on uh, like a, a level two or anything like that brewing in terms of uh, like a more easy way to use maybe Solana or something like that for, for lower cost NFTs? Yeah, so I, ha I haven't looked into um... I haven't looked into Solana or other kind of blockchains. I'm 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 mostly focused in both like um enthusiastically, so like as a hobbyist, as you know, professionally in my work life in, in the Ethereum ecosystem. So yeah, I'm familiar with the Polygon um ecosystem. I've personally minted quite a few um NFTs on Polygon for free. So no gas fees, um probably quicker and um you know there's those aspects as well but and i was kind of making this argument to someone that's you know basically consulting me um and you know the argument is essentially like gas fees aren't a bad thing in the nft space because you don't want to have too low prices because if you're going for a certain market you also have to kind of price for that market that's what a lot of people tend to forget they just think oh you know um, i'll have it at the lowest possible and then you know they'll completely forget about anchoring effects or completely forget about you know, sell psychology, and in 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 crypto, it's like um, there's one example where a guy he paid like five Ethereum to make sure that he's the first guy to mint a certain project. You know, he, he he's going to pay five Ethereum to like make sure he he gets you know a bundle of like NFT that he really wants. So again, it's like it prices out some people, but like are those are really the kind of people that you want to buy NFTs? I mean, obviously sometimes you want to like be mass market but, but it's another kind of consideration that not a lot of people uh you know consider yeah i mean if we go back here to the to the idea of values like if anyone can access it nobody wants it you know what i mean that kind of exclusivity really plays a role and i think you hit the, the head on the um the nail on the head there with do you really want everyone to be able to play the nft game look I'm going to be honest. The main reason why I don't participate in the NFT game, like I, I buy a few from creators I know because I like it, but I don't speculate. The number one reason is because I'm too poor for it. Like I don't have 10 Ethereum to bribe, you know, or, or anything like that. I don't have, uh, you, know, you know, like if I have 10 Ethereum, I can't use one Ethereum to buy NFTs. You know, it would be, uh, it would be irresponsible. You know what I mean? To allocate 10% of your whole portfolio or your whole play money to one, you know, risky trade you know what i mean so like i'm just too poor for it and it's one thing that people don't realize too is like when they criticize nfts like this is just like i don't know roman abramovich and the and the ben al the the so the owner of chelsea football club and the owner of uh, psg roman abramovich used to have the biggest yak in the world yacht in the world and then the psg owner bought the biggest yacht in the world so like us from the outside who can't participate in that we're like, oh my God, who would spend so, you know, who would spend a billion dollars on a yacht? And it's like, yeah, but you don't have a billion dollars to spend on a yacht. They do, so they spend it. You know, it's their kind of little, you know, uh, peacock in their kind of game and everything like that. So, what people don't realize with an NFT game is that, while it is true that some people with a very small portfolio, you know, just kind of, I don't know, really lucky or very, um, have a lot of conviction in investing when the, when you know, when the projects are absolutely unknown and they can. Uh, secure one or two and then all of a sudden you know just have the lottery and it goes up a thousand percent most people who are playing in the nft games are like early crypto investors who invested like five years ago you know it's like if you bought ethereum yeah. at uh, you know one dollar per ethereum you threw a thousand dollars at it you know you're right now i don't know almost a billionaire maybe i'm not sure you know of course you don't mind throwing 10 ethereum and something you know because it's like less than one percent of your portfolio you know so it's it's one thing that part i'm realizing that why do you want to market yourself to poor people like myself when it's poor people like myself who are not playing the game you want to market yourself you know it's it's it's, it's you know smart business you market to the people actually who can you, you know can pay it yeah certainly like and um regarding ETH especially, there's just been so much floating around because people have been buying it as the only way to get into all these other projects. And then things like yield farming, DeFi, things like that start to slow down. People don't want to make 
you know, 6% on their ETH, they want a larger return. So it's sort of just the money is finding the, like, wherever it can go, so to speak. It's it's not so much about new people just plowing fiat into ETH, but more, you know, like you said, uh, maybe some of these older school crypto guys. I, I know a couple of the NFT projects that I spend a lot of time reading about and everything have, like, well over half their... Um, stock so to speak of their 10,000 or 5,000 uh units held by you know about 30 40 people end up holding almost half the the stock so you're you're seeing that already in a in a really big way yeah there's like um i'm quoting uh i think this dude called sisyphus on twitter who's a very zero x sisyphus who's a really good follower i don't know if you guys know him but he kind of um i think the other day some nft mint um some dude just programmed a bot where he was managed to get like i don't know 50 percent of all the nft like the he, nfts were minted in like one minute and this yeah. dude with the bot just bought half of it he and bought just re yeah yeah with this bot bought half yeah. of it and resold it a minute later and they just made like an ins i don't know like a 3x in one minute basically or something like that and it's basically this uh, mev this minor extractable value i think it's called it's now part of the nft game too so it's like all these NFT, like, I don't know, there's, in the same way how retail, us normal people are kind of priced out of using Ethereum L1, I think we've almost reached the point, at for the, for in this current configuration of NFTs, it's almost reached the point where we're also just priced out of the of the NFT game, to be honest. And um, people just, people from the outside should just really realize that it's just, yes, of course it's rich people just buying profile picks for the fun of it because they can you know what i mean i don't know like uh i don't see it such as a bad thing or something you know of course it's it's the it's the same way of just showing off you know like the same way you buy a lambo because you can well you just spend a hundred ethereum on a profile pick you know what i mean right and like the one thing i like to think about it in sort of a similar angle there is like the first people who bought automobiles didn't buy them mostly for their utility they were more expensive and less reliable than using a, a horse or uh, a, a, a other systems but there was prestige about it there was like this hope that this was going to be a great new technology and that was enough to keep the market going sure that it got bigger and became a big thing 20 30 years later but it, it didn't stop it from being successful in the in the meantime too yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And and going back, because uh, I don't know, maybe I've said uh, um, shown a negative down, uh, negative light to NFTs. One of the positive things is, and actually, this is one of the value propositions of NFTs as art, is that people say, why would you buy a digital art when I can right-click copy it? And why not buy like a real painting, you know, offline painting? And the th and here's you flip the script, and it's like, why buy an offline painting where maybe 50 people in your lifetime who visit your house are going to see it when we're spending all day on the computer and I can have this piece of art display online to anyone in the world in my online gallery. You know what I mean? Entering that yeah. kind of metaverse aspect of it. So like there's really a lot of use cases that NFTs might not have now that will in the future. And there's a lot of investment. And that's part of the speculation aspect here too, because like it's kind of like how, I don't know, smart contracts on ethereum were i don't know three or four years ago where people know that there's something interesting and something valuable that's going to come but you can't really envision it because it hasn't occurred yet same with with nfts like just to think of um another use case is like uh andre cronier's uh new project uh, is it's called uh, rarity i don't know if you've heard of it it's kind of like role-playing game on the blockchain in that you Oh wait, oh no, I'm mixing it with loot, but it's similar to loot too. In that, basically, it's a whole new, different kind of social game on the blockchain, and it's something that's kind of never been done before, and it needs the coordination of a lot of people, and everyone can. Um, and then the thing is, you kind of have the characters on the blockchain, but then derivatives come out, in that maybe a company focuses on a specific world for those characters, and maybe another project comes out and um, is based on uh, rather than a world on um, another layer of composability and, der uh, and um, derivatives on top of the characters and maybe give them more law. And it's something that I don't think has been done before. And if it has, I don't know, never heard of it. You know what I mean? 
and these are just experiments. This is just like the kind of um, it's just how innovation plays. There's a lot of exploring. One will be successful, and once it happens, we'll look back and it'll be like it was obvious that it was going to be used for this. At the moment, we don't have that yet. Yeah, no, um, you know, I totally agree with all the things said, and um, yeah, I mean, it's just like Tesla's, you know, people were very enthusiastic about it before it, and also, um, you know, kind of looking back, I I, I remember um, when Crypto Kitties came out, and oh, this was around twenty seventeen, and I was actually someone actually I think airdropped me in a Crypto Kitty, and it's worth a million now or something, I don't know, but either way, it's like when that candy came out, it's like people were complaining that or oh, it's, it's just another fad and then people are like or oh, people will never buy and sell crypto kitties or any sort of like nfts basically and the other kind of argument people were making was that oh it's clogging the blockchain but i mean like we've come so far s since then and this is one of the eye like opening moments for me was basically i kind of i looked back and i was like oh shit this this is basically cl clogging the entire blockchain and people were complaining about it but now there's basically a new crypto kitty collection every day you know multiple times a day so um you know like in terms of like how much is, is evolved you know I, th I think that has to be also like considered as well yeah and also just the, the how um how easier and how accessible information and education is now like i kind of joined uh, the crypto world in 2017 I mean, I was a university student, so I just threw like 100 euros, you know, and just like kind of doubled the price at the peak. And then it just went to shit to like 50 euros. You know what I mean? So kind of. But I remember back then in the day, like there was no education. Like I had no idea. Like there was no uh, layman's explanation of what smart contracts were. There was no layman's explanation of what even MetaMask was. I didn't even use MetaMask. You know, everything was on my Coinbase. I, I had no, you know, there was no real or at least wasn't really accessible when you, you know, you just Googled it. Uh, I don't know what gas fees were or, or even what an application, a decentralized application was. Like it was just a kind of concept. Like you didn't even have an example of, you know, a DEX built on Ethereum, for example. So, yeah, they, we've gone a long way. And um, that's just how innovation happens. And also, like, I think one thing, the one thing to to that makes me bet on on nfts is really just innovation in a sense because i see so many indiv in the same way I, I don't know how familiar patrick is but i know grit is or like gumroad on twitter like it kind of in a way empowered uh individual creators right to publish under their own terms mm. and you know make most of the profit rather than just publishing under amazon for example and making way less pro um making le way less profit and having to depend on the on the platform of amazon no on gumroad you just open for everyone and you just sell via your twitter and that's pretty much it so like kind of the same but with nfts it's just in my in my, in my opinion just another layer another tool of empowerment i, I hate to use the word but it really is the p perfect word for this sense is like how it empowers individual creators to really own the distribution of their content and to really um just really not even depend on any platforms actually as long as the blockchain's running perfectly fine so sure right now you know expensive twitter profile pics and art and reasons for people to show off but there's musicians i've read some article about musicians who's like basically having social tokens in the forms of nfts i don't know how many but of himself so basically like buying stock of an individual mm -hmm. and the promise is or the iou or whatever is like you buy this collectible, this NFT, this I don't know, social token, you will have, uh, I don't know, an X percent of all my future royalties in perpetuity. Kind of like, this is my way of bootstrapping my career or bootstrapping my album. And um, to reward you as a fan and to contribute, and you get this. Like, he, you couldn't do this, you know, like, not even a few years ago. He, yeah, no, and it's um, it's inc I've, I've seen it happen with a couple of people I've talked to just this summer where they were able to sort of bootstrap their entire project by creating a Twitter account, basically investing, uh, you know, a, a few thousand dollars worth of Ethereum in some giveaways, just mm -hmm. start up a Discord, and then you launch an NFT project and you use that NFT project as your like seed money, and like that whole process can be done by somebody you know, in, in 40 hours a week alone, pretty quickly. Whereas, 
10 years ago, you needed a huge stack of cash. You needed to work with venture capitalist firms. You needed to work with um, publishers, advertising agencies. You needed to get so many more hands in the pot. Whereas like now through, you know, both the software and the uh, blockchain technology, it's like you can do that in a month or less, right? Yeah, it, it really kind of like how many of the, you know, Web 2.0, like, um, I don't know, like many of the Web 2.0 projects, uh, uh, startups that have dominated the world, you know, all these social media companies, all these Airbnbs, Uber, and all of this, they've kind of grown exponentially because, you know, uh, they disintermediated, dis uh, I can never say this word right, they disintermediated something, they removed a middleman and connected uh, user with customer, you know, just straight and you just take a small cut and, you know, they achieve these network effects. This is kind of similar, like with, with NFTs, like individual creators, like this is why I'm a big fan, just specifically because I, I believe, you know, in, in, the engi in, in the ingenuity of individual creators, like it really is a way of you owning your career, of not depending on anyone or not even a social media, or not even a social media platform. Like you own the distribution of, of your of your art, of your work, be it music, be it um, be it writing, be it or um, you know painting or anything like that. And it's just how can like I don't know how I just can't conceive of a universe in where giving more power to the individual creating and disintermediating, removing part of the middleman, which are the platforms that we are part of. I just can't conceive of any I don't know parallel universe in where this isn't successful. Yeah, I, th I think it's got like, I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of took a step away from the crypto market. Um, you know, I did a huge deep dive on crypto. I'm working on a documentary. Um, I'm doing a lot of like projects now in crypto. But like for quite a while, I, I kind of took a step back and I was just like, you know, washed my hands off. Obviously, you know, I held some stuff in it. Um, I just kind of left it there. And obviously that, you know, I did a 10x, 100x. And, you know, finding that again was quite good. But yeah, for like, you know, since the last bull market, I mean, since the last bear market, I was, you know, take a step back. And then one of the huge things that made me like basically quit everything and be like, you know, I'm going to dedicate the next X amount of years of my life to this kind of stuff. And so far it's worked out well, you know, was the fact that, you know, the whole DeFi space worked and it was operating well. And it basically, you know, there's a, a like a lot of the things that were theoretical, back in 2017, 2018 or whatever, you know, it basically came true. Um, and not only they came true, but like it, it came true in such a quick way and such a fast way. I was like, oh shit, you know, like it literally made me like realize, you know, there's something going on here that um, I need to definitely dive back into because I was 100% optimistic about it. Yeah, you know, I was tweeting about DAOs in like 2017 and now there are like functional DAOs and there's, you know, ways of like doing proposals. I think there's a lot of, interesting um things still that still need to be worked out um in, in regards to DAOs, but you know that was a huge thing that basically was like oh shit i can create my own DAO now um and i can stake and generate automatic interest and you know and th this crazy stuff that's that's being worked on right now yeah don't you have a DAO? yeah so i i have the metacol DAO, and I'm, I'm just kind of slowly building on top of that um and the way you kind of enter the DAO is you have a grid called Planet and I'll allow you entry to the DAO. And I'm, I'm working on a thing called a proof of association. So you essentially need to have like five or six people with planets to vouch for you and they will have all have to approve your application. Um, nice. and what, it, what it basically does it like, because you don't want things to grow so quick. And a huge problem in governance right now is, especially in DAOs, it's like they'll give anyone a governance token but what they don't do is like they, they are unable to control the memes. So the best way you control the memes is essentially you have a very confined group of people. So I'm basically, I mean, I've stopped giving away free Great Gold Planets. So like there's a floor now and like some people have brought up like five or six Great Gold Planets. But essentially, you know, there's like you have to know people to get into the club essentially. And that's where it's going to be. And I'm currently working on some other NFT projects which I can go to into in a little while after this, that will essentially, I, like, what I want to do is, like, airdrop people, like, you know, um, 
money essentially that from like profits from the projects I'm working on um, and, the, and the people in the DAO that help me um, push. So um, the, the other thing that you can do is uh, you can treat the, the DAO list essentially as an email list. Um, and it's going to be way more effective because you know, not everyone is sending emails as DAO, like if um, NFTs as emails and, you know, there's, there's a whole other load of, load of stuff. But yeah, the projects I'm working on, so I've got a few like collections I'm working on. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of held up in the artist stage. So with regards to like NFT art, it's like, it's the art that usually takes more time than the actual NFT contract. I deployed my first like NFT smart contract earlier this week, um, ERC721. Um, that, that was a pretty interesting experience and I definitely recommend you guys do it as well. Um, but yeah, the other kind of project I'm working on is an NFT lottery that uses DeFi to locking lock in total value like essentially um the amount of money we're gonna give away so i'm, I'm currently running a nft lottery in the, in the future where like you buy an nft to enter it and that nf the, the money from the nft will go into like um like a yield bearing vault and it will lock and i won the, the lottery is for a two million dollar property in london that my business partner has offered to um put up so you know it's, it's it's and like there's no other nft property lottery in the world so we'll be the first to do that if it happens on time and we're talking we're in talks with a platform called pool together i've reached out to them um and you know what they do is like they have like a savings program where you save x amount of money and they put that into like a yield aggregator and basically to do a lottery every week or so and you win like a couple hundred i suppose so they've got the mechanism, um, but we're going to add like NFT lottery on top and, you know, potentially someone's going to become a millionaire overnight with it. Okay. So three things. One, I have a grid called planet. How can I access this fucking DAO? Cause I'm interested Two, how can I access that lottery of a house? I'm, I'm quite interested there too. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, three, this is exactly what I, what I was referring to. Like, it, from the outside, the only thing you know about NFTs are expensive profile pics for Twitter. And from the inside, you just explained one thing that I've never heard of, like an application of NFTs, for example, in a you know novel way, could work out, could not, but it's innovation, it's trial and error, you know? And like you, there's so many smart, talented, and uh, you know, just very high spirited and high agency people yeah. trying new things with NFTs. like. How can anyone be bearish against it? Like, yeah, I, that, I swear this is what, yeah. So, so sorry, because I just want to echo that point uh, around like the smartest, most uh, sort of forward thinking people I know are all involved in this space right now. So that's that's kind of all I need to see. Yeah, it's exactly the same like line of reasoning for like when like like crypto, like a few years ago, it's like they finally found a way to have um, open source like properly monetized so you get smartest people in the world with an economic incentive like with an intellectual problem and the economic incentive that if they figure it out they become millionaires like why would you bet against that like there's just no way and yeah like uh, just to just to uh, i have a remark on that interesting proposal that you said about proof of association with a DAO. Mm. I think DAOs at the moment, I think the best example can be seen as the the, uni, uh, the Uniswap treasury at the moment, where like basically, I don't know, like four or five whales, or, or, or maybe it's a bit more, but say like a dozen whales control like half of what's the uni votes, because um, they hold the, the, the you know, at, at the end of the day, the uni, the uni token is just a governance token at the moment, and like half... Half of the the governance token are, are owned by institutions, basically. Like I don't know, I think it was like Berkeley uh, Institute yeah. of Law or something like that. You know, kind of this thing, and they kind of just proposed these wacky proposals of, yeah, what what was it? I think it was like DeFi lobby education or something like that. And it's like it was just a random Twitter egg account with no website or anything. It's like, yeah, we want this proposal to have twenty million uh, dollars, and uh, we're going to use it to lobby. And everyone's yeah. like, excuse me, no. what the fuck? Like, who even are you? You don't even have a Twitter profile. It's like, okay, yeah, we made a website, but yeah, we're going to win the votes because we, you know, we own half of the votes. Yeah. And boom, they just got the 20 million and dumped half of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is a very interesting point. And 
you know, one of the reasons why I said like there's a lot of things to be figured out in DAOs is because the entire proposal and governance mechanisms haven't been found out. There's loads of different experiments. We talked to um, Santiago of Democracy Earth, and you know, he was kind of detailing that there was a lot of internal strife, and then they had to actually meet in person. You know, all the people in the DAOs actually solve their issues. And, you know, that's not really like decentralization in, in its most uh, um, abstract sense, right? That's like you're meeting up so like, you know, you're centralizing in one spot and you're solving problems. So, and I've worked with like totally community owned decentralized projects and making decisions is usually a headache because they have to pre present a proposal. It has to have a time limit then they have to like, you know, vote it and then maybe vote it again if it's too close. So, so there's all these kinds of issues. And go, going back to my kind of like proposal, and I'm talking to someone, um, I can't remember his name, but he's working a proposal where um, it's like basically generational. So like, like your like basically you're scored on chain, and like you know if you if you do good or if you if you voted up against X amount, you know you're going into the next round. It it provides a boost, but the thing is that boost doesn't last. And the other thing is with a lot of these kind of like DAO governance issues is that they're off chain so like you know like they can be faked and they can be there's like the whole thing about cyber attacks um that uh, you know santiago is trying to combat and you know there's and a cyber attacks basically just like making loads of fake accounts right um and with proof of association it's just like entry to the DAO, and it's it'll be relatively free to enter but the thing is what it'll do it will it will create like an internal kind of group where you know you're like your value goes up and only people who can add value to the entire group, you know, go up. So it's going to be like, not the Freemasons or Illuminati, but like, you know, those kind of concepts usually work. And with Freemasons, you have to have two people vouch for you and then you go to like a committee. Um, mm -hmm. And there's no real like members only kind of DAO. So like what I want to do, I, I don't want it to be like able to make decisions decentrally. I want to, I want to be able to do stuff. I want to collaborate with people like I'm collaborating with Pat and basically use the DAO essentially as a platform like that I've kind of built and I'm kind of like in control of like I'll probably want to be owning like making 50% of the decisions and then using the platform as a way of interacting and engaging and um, allowing people to collaborate and then you know obviously they just promote projects within the DAO and then you know x amount of money that's just raised um, in projects and people supporting will go back into you know the community um, and just progress like that. That's a plan. Whether or not it works, I don't know. Um, I'm also working on like a coin, um, which is pretty easy to code, and um, like a yield farm with my CTO for another project. And yeah, I mean, this it's, it's, it's like just convoluted stuff, bro. Yeah. So like, just to just to like uh, continue with with the thought with the train of thought of um, of governance, really. Like, I read this tweet. I think because due to the rise of that problem uh, with Uniswap, I think, or or some other problem similar to that. So I remember reading a tweet of basically saying. DAO participants will soon start to understand why we have um, executive boards or something like that, you know, like how in companies and stuff, <laughs> because like decentralization has many upsides to it, you know, like you, you know, can't 51% attack you, can't, you know, is very like just and everything. But when it comes to leadership, like leadership shouldn't really be as decentralized or, or at least not completely decentralized, you know. And I think it's a problem that many people are finding with DAOs in that if decisions and 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 uh, important direction to take somewhere sometimes might even indicate lack of conviction on one side but on the other side it just might it's just um really limits the possibilities because like in many sense like okay in the traditional okay and uh in the ideal and utopian way of understanding politics is that you kind of outsource your decision making to someone who's you know more knowledgeable than you and maybe mm -hmm. better equipped to take these decisions because of x y and z in the practice we know it's completely fucking bullshit but that's kind of like the utopian version of it this in a sense will have to uh, i mean i have i don't have many opinions on DAO governance i absolutely no idea about it but I do know that complete decentralization just, in my opinion, lacks conviction because in a way, and I don't know, others might have share a different opinion, but okay, if I have to choose between Vitalik Buterin and myself to best wear, to really find the ne the next steps for Ethereum to take, like obviously it's Vitalik, 
who has the idea. And, you know, in a sense, why should I have the same opinion or influence on it? You know what I mean? And so there is a way of, um, I think there's a conversation rising where basically the losers of the whole econo uh, ec um, system and um, not economy, the whole ecosystem, sorry, of crypto, the actual losers are the devs because they're the ones making all the work. Then they have the headache of having to govern and listen to others. And others are taking the same amount of profit as them without building anything, you know? So I don't know. Those are just some random thoughts because just like completely decentralized, just lacks conviction in my opinion when it comes to DAOs. I think there should be not only, I don't know, maybe not the form of having one leader make all the decisions, you know, that might be the opposite of the spectrum. But definitely not 100% decentralization. I think it just lacks conviction and it's just chaos. Yeah, there's a sort of race to zero in terms of uh, the conversation as well, uh, when you just sort of open the, the floodgates, so to speak. Yeah, and uh, it just brings the rise of like, uh, I don't know, populism within DAOs, you know, like just whoever can shitpost the best or whoever can rally more people will just get away with doing whatever, you know, and there needs to be some kind of limit and um, not limit, um, limitations, I guess. I don't know, some kind of structure. And I think as an outsider, it's an interesting uh, intellectual thing to observe. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky I'm not participating. Obviously, I won't get rich because for the, the people who figure out will. But it's an interesting thing to observe from afar, surely. Cool. Um, one kind of question I have for you is essentially why are you not working on any NFT projects or crypto projects? Um, okay, the thing is, uh, on one hand, I have a bit of an imposter syndrome. On the other hand, I don't have the technical skills. And on the third, which is really the, the biggest reason, I think, is I don't want to stray away from the my current projects and my current direction. In a sense, um, crypto really confuses me. I think I, I think I have a good understanding of many things as an observer mm -hmm. and uh, as an investor of crypto and everything. But um, it, it's almost like an, a drug, an addiction to me in a sense that intellectually, uh, it's so stimulating intellectually. I think um, it, it's the perfect, it's the perfect like time sink, time waste and um, rabbit hole for people who have curiosity and uh, who are challenged by intellectual ideas. And I just find myself that I get sucked too much into this whole ecosystem and that I end up getting carried away by the next shiny object and I kind of lose focus. And I think losing focus is one of the worst, like for me personally, at least for others, they can make it work. But for me personally, losing focus is uh, something I'm just not willing to, um, not, not willing to, um, to negotiate with like, I've already lost quite a lot of significant focus while I was doing my other job, really, because I was just all day reading on crypto and everything. But I just never get anything done. And um, yeah, I just really, I've, I've really charted my life. I've really charted my goals and like my actions to achieve those goals. And I really want to stick to it, basically. I don't want to chase the next shiny object. I, I have my position in crypto. I change it sometimes with new information and everything. But I think I'm better suited to be a bit of an investor, you know, a bit of a retail investor rather than, you know, just engaging in a new project and then in two months time in another project and then in two months time in another project, to be honest. Um, just sort of on that point in terms of not wanting to get sort of involved directly, uh, we do have a guest coming up um, in a week or so here um, who's done a lot of work creating sort of secondary work on top of NFTs. So um, he's doing like uh, animations and background arts for um, the Forgotten Runes Wizards, as well as a couple other projects. And um, do you think there's a, a market there? I, I've seen this in terms of things like poetry and things like that, but do you think there's a market there in terms of writing prose for NFT owners, or like writing as a as nfts like we're seeing a little bit of that with like the loot dropped and all that definitely definitely and i think it's the kind of idea that um adds value on top of nfts it's kind of like the goal with nfts is like people buy now with the idea of it being valuable in the future this kind of like derivatives built on top of the actual nfts that's what can drive even more value that's why like 
the idea behind loot is so interesting because you kind of build your own reality and it's rather than you joining an existing project is the projects come to you you own the nft you just own a different or, or like the numbers one actually too, the end project which is similar to loot but you just have a random string of numbers attached this adds way more that's the whole point of people just throwing all their money at it is because this is a concept of you already own like the i don't know the code the base or whatever or the seed yeah all the, yeah the seed yeah yeah exactly like in minecraft like you own the seed but you're not bound to minecraft for example to just continue with an analogy of having a minecraft world is like you bring that seed and when you go to a different project maybe you have i don't know a grand theft auto world for example you know what i mean so yes of mm -hmm. course there's a market to it it's, like, it's actually one of the most bullish cases for nfts in my opinion yeah i'm uh, i'm particularly interested in that from the from the writing side i think uh i think something you'll see soon is like uh you know so, so, sort of a lot of the like big threads and things you see on like esoteric money twitter um being being minted almost as like collections of ideas yes i think so too uh one of our mutuals uh or grits mutuals uh with myself thomas thomas mm -hmm. bevan mm -hmm. he's working on something like he doesn't have a like a defined project or anything but he is very 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 interested and in, because he's a writer so he's very interested in nfts and uh i don't know how much i can share actually but i know he's okay I won't overshare just in case, but I know he's very interested in basically uploading his writings to the blockchain. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly know on what configuration. You can maybe um, like yeah. There's a protocol called Mirror. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've heard of Mirror too. The yeah. thing is, he's not exactly doing Mirror. The thing is, I've checked out Mirror, but uh, I don't know. I might be very, very wrong. I didn't check it for too long, but it just kind of seems like a popularity contest going on there. But uh, without going into that point, I know, like, for example, I know in OpenSea, you can't upload a PDF, but I think in Mintable, you can. And there is some, there is something there in the sense of, say you, I don't know, you write a book and uh, you legitimately have only a thousand copies. And, you know, the only way to own it is via, sorry, via NFT. Yeah, sure. Maybe you could. You know, right click, download the PDF, sure, genius, but you don't actually own the book and the value is in owning the book. So there is some value there too with NFTs, not just like visual NFTs in the form of art, but also like there's already music ones and I think text based NFTs. I think there, there's something yeah, there. Yeah, someone too. just on the music one, someone actually made an NFT platform on my Discord and I only checked it out recently and apparently it's doing really well. So yeah, yeah, like yeah. yeah. Those I think one of these people. one of these NFT projects which have got all the crypto Twitter guys buying them. I think audio glyphs or something like that. I'm not sure. It's like something yeah. to do with that, which is basically music. Yeah, I've heard of them. Um, I can't remember what the exact name is though. Yeah, me personally, like my natural disposition is like I don't I don't really like to buy things. I like to like make things. So like. I've just been like uploading my own kind of things and just playing and experimenting and yeah, I'm not, I don't know, a lot of people are in a rush to like make things, which is funny, um, but yeah, um, I'm not, I try not to be in a rush anyways, but yeah, I, I think what's also interesting is the kind of space as well, it's like, it's quickly like everyone's just making a project, um, I, I don't know if that's good or bad, you know, due to like whole, um, market dynamics if there's too much of a certain project obviously price decreases but i'm I I, i'm kind of wondering along that point if there will be more hesitancy where people want to make their first project really good um where there's maybe this sort of uh there's, there's a little bit of this sort of idea that people who are doing too many projects should be kind of st sh shunned sort of thing a, and that there's too many kind of pump and dump 10k projects you know maybe even some of the one-to-one -one artists are just kind of out producing their audience so to speak so like i i think there'll be more um more of like the rookie card phenomenon being important so like 
you know, yeah. uh, the th I can't remember who talked about this. I think you actually brought this up to me, Grit, like uh, maybe th two or three months ago. But like the idea of like someone's first NFT that they minted being like ex more valuable just just because of that. Yeah. So, um, so like you know, it's, it's a similar thing to the Crypto Kitties or like the um, rare, not rareable, but like maybe marble cards. But there's a there's a collection of cards like yeah, curio cards, and the curio cards like don't get me wrong, they they're pretty okay, they're good. But like, if you just saw them like printed on paper, like you wouldn't pay much attention to them. But the fact that they were minted initially in twenty seventeen, um, you know, is what basically you know drove the price. And people were like, "Oh wow, these are valuable, so I'll buy one." Um, and you know, they just like the floors just get eaten up. And, and that's what it is, really. It's like people who have a lot of disposable money, they'll buy the floors if they think it's valuable. Um, but yeah, touching on your point, I think. I think there are a lot of like low barrier kind of projects people are doing and what we're kind of seeing now is you know innovation in the in the, in the most capitalist sense so like there's like small iterations small deviances better ways of doing things and what this is doing is just like increasing the you know the bar i think it's raising the bar overall and um i, I think ultimately what's going to happen is like the, the things that are like cash grabs and um you know very blatant kind of like ripoffs or whatever they're going to be like eventually discarded i think people may make a lot of money from them in the short term in the long run i don't, I don't really think those kind of people last um because everything i've seen is like you know people just kind of find out and people just get bored of your your shtick yeah 100 percent. this is like similar to like the dot-com bubble where we're kind of like you had the you know the real decent uh you know companies and everything but then people just realized that as long as you had a website, you could make a lot of money. So, you know, of course, there's cash grabs. But and uh, this is, I think, one of the critiques that people outside of the NFT space make that this is a bubble. This has to explode. And yes, of course it has. But it's just that, you know, I don't know, blue chip, quote, quote, projects such as, I don't know, CryptoPunks, for example, they're always going to be valuable because, you know, they were, you know, they hold value as being like the first ones. It's the 69th iteration of crypto punks you know where it's literally the same ones but just with i don't know disabled crypto punks or taliban crypto punks you know yeah of course those are the the cash grabs and of course those are ones that are going to go to zero but the thing is do you want like i don't know it's up to everyone's con like as a consumer it's up to you to you know you know the game you're playing if you're playing the speculation game you just you know that you're waiting you know you're waiting the the ponzi game of who's the one who's going to come after me who i can sell and yeah. the thing is, many times it's just you and you just got to admit the game and that's it and not complain about it. But when you're actually wanting to do something good about it and everything, I think you'll put it uh, like you will you will last longer, you know, because like if you're a creator and you're just trying to do something unique and interesting and, you know, something new and everything like I think your followers, you know, will realize if you're just doing a cash grab or if you're really you know, just learning and making an effort, you know what I mean? So like, sure, there's people who, you know, go on fiber and uh, get some fiber freelancer to, you know, make NFTs and then just say, hey, floor price won, won Ethereum. And then you get actual, you know, creators putting time, sweat, tears, love and, you know, to make something unique. So, something like Niels, for example, my friend Niels, like he's, he's making NFTs now. And uh, sure, first step of him making NFTs was, he already has, for those of you who don't know, he's an artist. He's like paints physical paintings and everything. And um, his first NFT was a picture, uh, a painting that I own. So a painting of myself. And I said, hey, I'd like to own the NFT version of my painting. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you. So, you know, obviously uploaded as a, as a photo of the painting and turned into NFT. Okay, so he experimented with that a bit. He's having some success. But now he's saying, okay, rather than having existing projects, where I just take a picture of the painting and then just turn it into an NFT. I'm going to make, a, a, I'm going to try a different thing. And now he's got like a, what he's got is a project where, where he's basically saying, okay, here's an NFT. The NFT is literally an IOU. When you buy this from me, you can choose to, you can choose two options. Um, make a painting of yourself and keep the NFT. Or if you want me to make a painting or whatever you want, and you keep the NFT and the original painting, you know, and, 
that's just some different innovation. And then there's others where, I don't know, making a collection, which is 100% for NFT holders, where you can't hold, when you can't buy the original painting. And that's never a cash grab, in my opinion. Or Thomas mm. mentioned before, whenever he figures out how to upload this stuff, or another friend who's uploading music, you know, it's like, those might not turn millionaires overnight, but the roles are not going to go to zero, in my opinion, because it's not some random Anon who's uploaded a Twitter profile and just said, I don't know, Taliban punks, you know, and just yeah. gone along with it. Um, we, we would, I mean, time's gone really quick, actually, so it's been about 70 minutes. It w is, I mean, I suppose we could talk for, we booked out, we booked out about two hours, so we, you know, we've got a lot of leeway. But I just wanted to get through any sort of like questions you had or you know anything that you didn't get. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, I, I have asked you in private like what your DAO was about and what your NFT projects were, which you have mentioned now. Um, I mean, I'm working on like two of a project. So I mean, two of a major project. So okay, so yeah, please explain them then. So the NFTs and the DAOs, they're more like hobbies. And like what, what we've kind of, me and Pat have discussed with this podcast is like, you know, is there a way to like turn it into a sort of DAO kind of mechanism where, you know, if we are to sell it, you know, do we give back to the people that we've interviewed or, you know, we were kind of exploring that. But, you know, what, what we kind of discussed is pretty very nascent and very early. But with the DAO and NFT stuff that I'm doing, it's like, it's not really a priority. Like my priority is, are essentially like I'm working on two startups and I'm also consulting. So with my um, startup, my main startup is a DeFi project. Um, I don't want to go into it too much because it's still very, very early. Um, but essentially it's, it's going to be like DeFi for real world assets in a way that really hasn't been done before. Like I don't, or at least we don't know any project that's done it. I've talked to quite a few people about it. We we're putting together a board of advisors. We're in the friends and family round and we've raised a um, couple hundred thousand. I don't want to give the exact figure, but it's, it's going pretty well, let's say. And then the other project, which I've recently, I literally tweeted out today, which we're white um, we're creating a waiting list for, is a, it's called Tribs. And essentially it's a, and it's a crypto platform, but for like high-end fashion. So like what we're trying to do is basically map the entire fashion ecosystem onto blockchain and then, you know, create some sort of um, a more consumer friendly peer to peer kind of um, place. Um, so th those are the main two things. And then what I'm also doing, um, consulting with my team. So I've got a team of about five to eight people at any one time. And what we're doing is essentially just helping a few crypto companies, um, you know, develop their product, grow, um, and a lot of business development. So reaching out to key figures, putting together like advisory boards, uh, you know, going through tokenomics, all this other kind of stuff, and then kind of guiding them through the process um, of, you know, the whole kind of platform. Because my background is, you know, I've spent a decade in project management now. So, yeah, um, you know, I've just been helping businesses, essentially, and startups grow. So, that's, okay, so that, that's more or less everything I'm doing. Yeah, so I do have a question then, because it's it's an idea that you've tweeted a few times, actually. Yeah. And it's and I think it's the kind it's kind of one of the um, the value propositions of NFTs that everyone who understands NFTs knows that it's eventual, that like is inevitable to come, but this still hasn't been figured out. And that is NFTs and property rights and property rights and specifically I think like real estate. I know you've you've mentioned before, kind of having real estate on the blockchain and stuff like that. And I don't know if you could like explore that thought further because I know. I just vaguely remember a tweet. Yeah, I mean, I I can't I can't like. So oh wait, what... is that one of the pro? If that's the project you have going, then no. But I know you've mentioned this like, actually like years ago too. That's why I ask. Yeah, so I've I've also talked about private equity swaps. So basically, you can tokenize like your future asset earnings, um, of like so like everything I own, I can tokenize and then sell on and like redistribute income, and fractionalize. So there's all these other things. So. But going back to the the property rights stuff, so like my DeFi protocol will be dealing with real estate, but real estate is very tricky. It's like it's one of the hardest things to basically legally enforce a sale of, right? Because you have um you have like um domicile rights, you have squatters rights, you also have 
like I I can buy your house, Ben, and like you can le- legally live there for like X amount of months. Yes. But I won't be legally allowed to like kick you out. So there's all these different things that go into real estate, and 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 you know just through like personal experience because I'm talking to like property lawyers in the UK, um, it's it's very very difficult to put on chain because it's not very easily legally enforceable. So like the purchase of a of a car is way easy to put on chain because you can like you don't have all these like tied up very old legal um uh-huh. tunes around okay and i know you've mentioned before like, i'm literally asking you like very like i'm, I'm gonna go darker and darker you fa- like there was something like just related to what you said or like tokenizing all your future earnings you've mentioned before something about how literally like owning someone or owning some like exactly that maybe yeah maybe you've so, heard of that yeah i'm and this is something i'm very excited to talk about because I want to experiment with my DAO in doing that. So, like, what I want to do with the DAO is basically give away like, you know, x amount of percent of like everything I do or earn back into the DAO. And like, you're investing in me, and I'm 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 giving back, and I'm like, you know, I'm essentially like tokenizing and securitizing, you know, me myself, right? Like- um, and that's why I, I'd say like my DAO is more of a creative DAO where. You know, we do collaborations, we do creative projects and all this sort of stuff and we kind of give back. So, yeah, like private equity swaps are so essentially there's a concept of um, like bonded labor, I suppose. But essentially like a student loan, right, is uh-huh. they'll give you a student loan and then they think that, you know, through abstract reasoning, through economics, you're basically going to improve the economy over a long period of time because you're more educated blah 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 but this what private equity swaps are essentially i can invest in you like say so i'll give you 10 pounds right and then i um i'm not i don't want to go too deep into it because it is something i I may do in the future or i am working on it's like i'll give you like and then you give me an iou token and then basically i can sell this token on so like if you own a grid called planet and i'm giving you guys like ten dollars a month that's worth 120 dollars a year right so somebody will be willing to pay this but that private that that grid called planet could be worth more in the future if i'm you know if i'm making more money in a sense uh-huh like the idea of like a personal ipo almost yeah 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 that's what i was yeah. thinking like basically like you incorporated and basically like shares of <sighs> yeah so stuff, this but... concept is very like it's done it's like loads of people are doing it but like there's loads of different ways of doing it so like idea market essentially is doing this in through truthfulness, so like you can invest in someone's credibility or truthfulness, um, and you can own part of it. And then all there's like certain DAOs. So basically, I want to turn my like social media into a DAO. So like anyone that interacts with me, in theory, could be able to get a token. Or you know, if I if I mint cult coin, I can just basically airdrop people coins. You know. Yeah. So okay, my question is, and it's something that I always ask myself when involved when getting involved with your content. What do you think about the legality and the morality and ethics of some of these ideas? To be honest, um, so, just, so, for the, just for the for the listeners' sake, okay, so they don't think we're all twisted bastards. So essentially, with, with the DeFi stuff, it's like it's one hundred percent totally above board. It's going to be fully doxed. Um, I'm getting advisors on board that that literally predicted the whole SEC thing with Brian Armstrong. Um, you know, so like that, like I'm not tokenizing. I'm not tokenizing any project. So like, I'm like one part of me is like we need to tokenize every literal thing, right? But yeah. then you have the SEC involved, and I don't really want to get involved with those guys. So I'm probably going to hold off. So with the grid called Planet, it's basically just a membership token into um, possibly earning something. I mean, you could sell it on, but it's not really um, like a security, right? It's a yeah. it's a it's a members only club, essentially. You know, that, like that's the legality of those kind of things. Um, the other thing, so that NFT lottery is is it's legal to do a property lottery in the UK. Um, yeah, that's that's literally it. So like, we're literally doing a property lottery, but like instead of having normal tickets, you're having NFTs on chain, which can be directly put into uh, a yield farm. You know, like the thing is, I. I wasn't concerned about like um, legality or ethics of the projects that you have going on because like you know I trust you and everything. It's more like the things that we've been speaking about like 
owning basically a, a, a participation of a person, you know, which is, I don't know, could be understood as slavery almost, like if the person doesn't deliver. Like how does, for example, this kind of con it literally feels like coming from Harry Potter or something, you know. Like, yeah, like this kind of yeah. Like when the person who owes you ten percent of your income yeah, their income like, stops you paying you, what yeah. do you do about that? Yeah, it's like that that that's where I'm my mind's going. It's like how how does this how can this be enforced or, or what even are the ethics of this? Like I mean if you don't want to go there, just let me know. But I'm just like <laughs> I'm just having fun it's, with it's an interesting idea because, well, a lot of what is being done in the crypto space is not technically legal because the laws don't exist yet. They're True. like so many things are being done that haven't been done before. There's no sort of, you know, if you talk to a lawyer or an accountant right now to try and get, you know, a, a square answer on a lot of things, they just don't have it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with that. And that, that is actually the case. It's like, I'm I'm definitely erring on the side of caution, but like I'm also I'm at that stage where I can experiment. I have time to experiment. The people I work with allow me to experiment. So like my my kind of stage is like obviously you know do everything above board. Um, I'm not really looking for profit. If people want to pay for things, so like I've airdropped a lot of free NFTs. I could have charged people for those, and people have paid a lot of money for those. Um, you know, so like again, it's like I'm not really doing this for the money like I've, I'm, I've got working on legitimate projects i've got legitimate investments um you know so i'm not too frustrated about that kind of quick cash grab a lot of people are um so and i think that kind of like saves me in the long run because then i can just do it for the love of it i guess um and you know just let my curiosity take me where it should yeah just uh just to quickly get to your point earlier there ben around um the whole space being a like playground for those who are curious about new ideas and everything um i think that's uh that, that's a big reason why i'm here and i think the way you said that earlier sort of summed up my feelings almost almost entirely <laughs> yeah 100 percent. like at the end of the day like even when i don't know you've got to apply these kind of heuristics like okay if I don't understand something, how can, what can I apply? What kind of modeling of it can I, can I apply to sense make, even if I don't have, understand it? And at the end of the day, like if you reduce, I, I reduce it all to, are you going to bet against the, I don't know, a collection of the smartest people of the world openly collaborating and who have financial um, incentives to do it right and to collaborate? Like, no, there's like no way in hell I'm betting against that. Right cool. Yeah, I think, I think that's more or less it. Um, I think we can wrap up here and uh, thanks for hopping on. Well, thanks for having me. I, you know, as as mentioned before the this uh, the recording, like you've been teasing with having a podcast for three years, so I've known you for like, or at least known about you for three years. So like, I just you know couldn't help myself when I saw the opportunity. So thanks for having me, <laughs> guys. No yeah, it was great to have you. <laughs> yeah, thanks you. Thank you. Cheers, guys.